sound roaring and din and interference in my ears. Worse today, it presses in my ears as though the drums might burst and a noise come through that is more terrible still. Perhaps before long, that is all I shall hear and she will be playing and all I hear is noise. Again, please. From the beginning again and more so. More like this. La, 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 la. La 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 <laughs> Like that. There is no music quite like that. Unless the animals heard a music in their hearts and wanted us to hear it and uttered it the best they could. The music of the animals might sound like that. So beautiful. Biting her lip, sometimes her tongue. The revealed tongue. And frowning, leaning forward, posture all wrong. So beyond expression, lovely to behold. Listen, listen. Listen the music out. The music is in there. It only wants listening forth. Read if you must. Mark it. Get it by heart. Then close your eyes and listen. Feel for it with the fingers. Feel for what the heart feels. Feel it with your fingers. He stands behind me when I'm playing to watch my hands. No other man stands near me like that. He smells of tobacco. Is it only tobacco, or like an animal, a good one? Everyone calls him ugly. His jaw protrudes, his nose is flat, he's pitted and pocked. The hair of his face, however he shaves, goes up to his eyes. Yes, they are right, he is fearsomely ugly. Beautiful when she closes her eyes. I look and look. I get a face by heart forevermore. Such license when a girl closes her eyes, as though I were invisible. Thank God for my genius. Thank God I am the master. What mother otherwise would let me interview her daughter closely and learn her face by heart? They let me in. It is permitted. I am authorized. Julia. Julietta. Juliet. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. The music is in there already. I put it there myself. It only wants feeling for. It doesn't want a pickaxe or a shovel. It only wants your hands. They never play lightly enough. Fingers not so, not so, not flat, not so high. Bend them. I straighten my fingers the way we were taught to. The way he says is wrong, quite wrong. I straighten them on purpose when he's behind me so that he will lean over with his hands and put them on mine to bend them how he likes. He does not wrap my knuckles with a knitting needle the way he does the boys. Still, he corrects my hands. I have the permission. It is allowed. It is my job. I stand behind her. I inhale the scent of her hair. My arms come over her and round her. I, the Spaniard, the Moor, the Blackamoor. I lean my head over her scented neck, and my black hands cover her small white hands and correct the fingering, lighten the touch. I, touching hers, make blessed my rude hands. Oh, the white wonder of dear Juliet's hands. It is allowed, it is required of me, and underneath her hands are the cool keys, and in them lives my music, longing to come forth. His hands are short, squat, ugly, like paws. The hairs on the backs of his fingers are like a hog's bristles, so black. I see my hands disappear under his. My hands have never been held like that before. So much to do, and now this. How they will laugh when it is general knowledge, when the world knows my affliction, what hilarity there will be. I shall turn like a baffled bear in high society, this way and that, trying to hear, and only the noise in my head instead of speech. I shall have to read their writhing lips, lean closer to their ugly working mouths, to receive their compliments and their instructions. I shall turn like a bear among the dogs, veering this way and that to hear a right. How they will laugh, the maestro, death. Give it a year, then kill yourself. Suffer it a year, write music day and night, then kill yourself. I have his secret. 
I know his terror. He says he can see how I pity him and that I am a comfort. He says he loves me. I wonder, do I love him? Okay, that passage again. La, 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 lighter. Feel how it yearns there on the brink of deliverance, already on the brink of release into the silence, how it yearns and longs. Now I will play for you. Now sit beside me while I play for you. So I will hear your music as it really is. He was worse today. As I played, he bowed his head to listen. But at times he rocked it to and fro, covering his ears. It is our secret. He says he will kill himself when it is general knowledge. Of course I tell him he will do no such thing. Yesterday he stood beneath my window when I was dressing for dinner. He sang De Vieni a la Finestra, O Mio Tesoro, in a most hideous voice. I stood at the curtain spying on him. The servants came out into the courtyard behind his back. He put his hand on his heart and sang like a hyena. I wept, quite suddenly. He took me by the throat. Why did I weep? And, and then he was Romeo, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. You know, a friend has given him the new translation. He carries it with him everywhere. I opened the window a little and showed myself to him, smiling. Then he roared with laughter and ran away, holding his head. He is quite mad. It is a great honor. Do I love him? Mama knows all there is to know. Not about his secret. Not about the din in his ears and the wreck of the noblest faculty, as he calls it. That is our secret. But she knows how he loves me. Day after day, she admits him with a smile. He arrives at two for my lesson and stays all afternoon. Mama says he will write you a sonata. She says you will be immortal, Julietta. Mama would not mind if I loved this genius. I will have a sonata. My name will live forever. A friend is visiting him at present. The friend who gave him the little Shakespeare for his pocket. His name is Casimir. They have known each other since childhood, so it seems. The friend has a past the police would like to know about. Or perhaps they do already. I, I told you Mama has a new lover. He is somebody important in the Ministry of Truth and Lies. Surely he knows about Casimir. Casimir never speaks. He watches us. I do not like the way he watches us. You would detest Vienna, as I do. It is an inner circle of depraved frivolity. The pox has eaten their faces, but they paint and powder thickly and will dance to the bitter end. They pay to watch wild animals tear each other apart, or to watch two pianists compete in improvising on a given theme. They have a phrase to describe their own condition. You hear it every hour of every day, desperate, but not serious. Again and again, on every occasion, their health, their government, the outlook for their souls. Oh, desperate, but not serious. They give you this reply with a knowing smirk. They know, they know. These creatures seem to believe that knowing will redeem them. I'm always under surveillance in this circus. 
There is an informer at every gathering, sometimes two or three. They inform on one another. Then, in the ministry, 10,000 clerks collate and file the trash away. All the energy of government goes on spying. Imagine the lives of the creatures in the ministry. It is certain that their bodies are as white as grubs. I pass the ministry daily on my walks. I swear I can hear the pullulating of its grub and maggot life. I hear the droning of its work of putrefaction. Cadavers. Cadavers. Our friend is a sorry sight at times. I never saw a man bow more uncomfortably. He sees me watching him. He winks a grotesque eye. He has a saying of his own. It is, what must be, must be, said with the grimace of a martyred satyr. Muss es sein? Es muss sein. But his affliction is very great. Now that I know his secret, his suffering is cruelly apparent. He turns his head like a nervous beast, this way and that, wherever the noise is coming from, to catch what they are saying. I see the yellow light of panic in his eyes. He lives under the cover of his famous distractedness, his raptors, as they call it. In this concealment, he may survive a few more months, so he believes. Then he will kill himself. But how he works. So little time, he says, so much to do. Fear is the spur, not fame. Dread, terror at the thought of the failing of his powers. What of the new republic now, my friend? Does it live in a memory and nowhere else? Do you remember fraternity? Did we dream the whole thing? In this ninth circle of the damned, it is rare that two or three will gather together to talk about their ruined hopes. We know one another, the few of us, by the old signs and watchwords, but mostly we pass in silence, too afraid to speak. They marvel at my recklessness in coming here, but I wish to see our friend. I have no other encouragement on my track from land to land. I live here under his doubtful protection for a while. Your friend, why does he look like that? Because he's disappointed. Because he wanted better. Because he saw it so he believes not very long ago. And now all he sees is the worst. The way he looks at us, we are the very worst. Perhaps. Though he does most cordially now to test the French. They saw the better. They made it visible. Then they betrayed it in the terror and the wars. But we, you, I don't mean you, I mean the people roaring behind my back like the roaring in my head. They, let us call them they. They are what they always were. They have nothing to betray. He's in danger here. Why did he come? He came to see me. He watches you. He asks how I am faring in my immortal soul. He has an idea of me. He asks, am I living up to that idea? And are you? He knows my affliction. He sees me struggling. I am sustained. I am lifted up by his idea of me. We left home together ten years ago. I came here through the armies and the refugees to make my own way in the service of my gifts. He went to Paris as a citizen of the world. He wished to serve in the defense of the new republic against the old corrupt regimes. And that very republic betrayed him. But for a lucky chance, he would have lost his head. Now he's an exile and a fugitive. What home is there in Europe for such a disappointed man? I dislike his look. I wish he wouldn't bring his disappointment to bear on me. Turn so his eyes are on my face, not on yours. I love his look. I have become his hope. He looks to me. 
Now he knows my affliction and he fears for me. He fears I will lose the necessary courage. He fears for our common hopes that have survived thus far. Now, I see only you, and you see the room of people behind my back. You must keep your eyes on me. I will not have you looking over my shoulder at the disappointing world. Look at me. Julie. Julietta. Juliet. Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? Enough of all that. What am I really? Speak to me as I really am. When you play, you are what my music really is. You are the means of its becoming audible in the world. I do not play very well. You play so that I can hear how music enters on our human senses. I can hear the very process of its entering us. Music is not a finished thing. Music is a becoming. And as it becomes itself, as it comes to life, so it urges us to do the same. To come into being. To come into fullest life. That is what you see in me. That is my idea of you. Suppose you are wrong. Suppose I am more like the people behind my back. Suppose I am only like them. Whose idea of you will you wish to live up to? You decide. Perhaps I love you when I play. Perhaps I am becoming able to love you equally as you love me. Perhaps. And perhaps when I play, I am in the process of becoming free. You have no idea, you and your friend, how hard it is for a woman to become free. Were we freer in his republic? I doubt it. In mine you would be. Free. Equal. My sister. My spouse. Here comes Mama with her new lover. He is a minister in the Ministry of Spies. He is a very important policeman. He will incarcerate your Casimir when he chooses. Mama and her policeman are coming towards us, smiling. She will take you by your hairy paw. She will ask you to play. Will you play? Yes, I will play. The respectful audience will be as quiet as mice. I will have the roaring louder in my head and against that din, in terror of its getting worse and worse, in terror of the premature ceasing of my gifts. So little time, so much to do. I will improvise on the theme of you and me. You will follow me perfectly through every, however intricate, development. And my friend Casimir will follow me too. This is a new age. This is the dawning of a new age. And its name shall be called the Age of Disappointment. Whoever wins, we shall have kings and popes and emperors as before. Old ones or new ones, they will be as they were. There will be no fraternity. Only force, subjugation, lies and spying. Only greed, selfishness and vile obedience. And here, especially, while the poor rot... The rich will go on riding their hellish carousel. True. But fraternity came on the point of a bayonet. Nobody wants fraternity offer them like that. Why should they? So they side with the worse against the better. How shall they see that it is the better? They saw the invading French. Such hope we had. Do you remember this? The age of kings is dead and done. It is disgraceful in you still to want a king. You are too old. It was perhaps a different matter in your father's day, but now there is no help for you till you will help yourselves. Yes, I remember that. We live in the memory. Without the memory, there can be no hope. What if the very memory were erased? 
What sort of future could we even desire if the memory of our hopes were to be erased? The job of the police in the new age will be to erase our memory. If they succeed, we shall not even know we are disappointed. How could that? At what? Nothing. You were saying? The idea is not in doubt. We know the idea in our heartbeat and in the pulsing of our blood. The devil is in the execution. What a face liberty had in Paris towards the end. I saw it. It was the Medusa. I feared it had petrified my heart. Holy hark at that, so lovely. You heard something. Something you say is lovely. Nothing. A flute. A shepherd, I suppose. Very faint, scarcely audible. I heard nothing. My head is quiet today. The roaring is less, very faint, like the sea, I imagine. Like the waters around Prospero's island on a still day. But I heard nothing. Casimir, I give it a year. Then I shall kill myself. You will do no such thing. You have no right to. No right to? No man has the right to die by his own hand. What he can still do somebody some good. And you can do good in abundance. You can imagine order, harmony, just distribution. You can set it out in black and white on stage for others to realize and hear and be affected by and want the better life. You have an order at your disposal, compared with which this order of kings and popes and emperors is a slaughterhouse, a bawdy house, a shit house. And the minister and his police will never censor you. They cannot read the revolutionary script of music. That's as may be. But in your case, have you the right to die by your own hand? I had no thought of doing any such thing. Abiding here in mortal danger amounts to that. I cannot leave till I am sure of you. Indeed, I cannot live unless I am sure of you. Nor I. Unless I am sure of you. When the noise gets worse, when I can hear nothing but ugliness in my head, I must think that my friend is listening for me somewhere. That flute again. I saw it in your face. The shock of beauty cannot be concealed. I could not hear it. I saw it in my dear friend's face. I know a painter has gone blind. He lies in the dark now, inconsolable. I fear for him. He was forewarned. The doctors gave him up. When he could scarcely see the hand in front of his face, he asked me to escort him to a little wood near here. Between here and Heiligenstadt, just over there. It was now, a year ago. He wanted to see the bluebells one last time. He went on his knees in the streams of bluebells and bowed his head. Imagine the scent of the streams of bluebells in such proximity. And the woods so rinsed with birdsong. The light sieved through the soft new beech leaves, and in that light the rinsing, fluting, caroling of the blackbird and the thrush. And from outside, from the hill, perhaps from this very hill, insistently the cuckoo. And my friend was on his knees, pressing the blueness of the bluebells against his open eyes to be healed by miracle at the last minute. He does not believe in miracles. It was to get the blueness by heart, to get it into the inner eye forevermore, always thereafter on his bed in darkness, to be able to see the Maytime blueness of a year ago. For it is heartbreaking, is it not, to leave behind the lovely phenomena of the earth and go into a darkness where they can't be seen except in the head, in the freedom behind the extinguished eyes. There he sees them. Like streams of living water, he sees the absent bluebells. And with them he smells the scent, and with the scent he hears the singing of blackbird and thrush, and the strange disembodied insistence of the cuckoo's notes. Litany of 
my miseries. Colic. Some mornings I am like Caliban when Prospero torments him. I curl around my belly like a grub. I howl, I whimper. My chamber pot sits close by the piano. I compose in stink. I wipe my arse on B.A. Do and scraps of old sonatas. The quack said freezing baths. Then he said lukewarm baths of Danube water, fortified with a sweet infusion, and by mouth a quantity of efficacious pills. That for my belly. There is a connection, medical science believes, between my griping belly and the din and failure of my ears. Oil of almonds stuffed into my lugs and cotton wool. Wads of herbs applied against the orifices and held in place by a lady's ribbon passed under my chin and fastened in a bow in the thicket of my black hair, or as a scalding poultice on my belly. Why not? Now comes news from Berlin of miracles worked there in the public view by a certain Dr. Kratz, a disciple of the great Galvani. A child, deaf since birth, cured by the application of electricity. The shock, the twitch, the leap, and oh, at once in rushes human speech, bird song, pure liquid flowing of the pianoforte, and the lovely higher reaches of the violin. Patience. Patience, patience, and resignation. Scarcely begun, must I resign myself to doing nothing more? So much to do, so little time. Listen, listen. Hear how it insists, how it reaches up and out and onwards and beyond, always for more and more. Impatient, unresigned. How it wants and longs. How it aspires. So that if they listen truly, they would not applaud. When they applaud, they seem to be congratulating themselves. If they listen truly, they would be silent. They would look into their own soiled hearts and weep. And then aspire, make vows, make promises. Having glimpsed the better not to settle for the worse. This I can do. Unsettle, agitate, push and push. Hear how the music pushes at the limits, how it disallows our settling for less. Listen, remaining as you are, you will be a disappointment. It is not good enough. You are not made to settle for so little. Push and push. The best I can hope for is some quietening in my head. The most I can pray for is my own silence. I imagine a silence like an anchorite in the Egyptian desert in the middle watches of the night. And in such silence I will house and listen to what only I in all the universe can hear. Hear it, set it down in black and white, and give it out into the world of men and women, there to be made audible. The prospect of this terrible freedom petrifies my heart. It has the look of the Medusa, such an icy freedom. No girl in it singing, no child in it chattering, no cuckoo in Maytime on a hill near Heiligenstadt. I shall be ever more uncouth, ever more beast and bedlam. Cruzo, Caliban, the common human beings will visit me in mockery and awful dread. I see it. I foresee it. Wake. Rise immediately. Summer or winter, let it never be later than half past five. Every season has its beauties. The mists and silver dew or the freezing stars. Relieve the belly and the bladder. Swell out the mouth. Douse the grisly face in the coldest possible water. Brew coffee black as the beard. And then begin, by lamplight or in earliest sunlight at the window, study the masters. Master the craft. Learn the old in hopes of the new. 
Learn rules in hopes of liberty. Learn everything achieved in hopes of what cannot be achieved except by you. Study, learn. Bow your head in the early morning over the works and teachings of the masters. So much to learn still, in the early hours, before the ordinary day begins. During my lesson, they began to talk about liberty. I doodled on the piano. Casimir wondered, had I anything to say? I said, no girl or woman of my acquaintance has any liberty, though some very stupidly suppose they have. And then I doodled on the piano and thought my thoughts. Before very long, Mama will marry me off. Next spring, perhaps. A spring wedding. She has an elderly gentleman in mind. He has the necessary funds. That is what will happen to me. I quote, what must be, shall be. I look in the mirror and I look around me and I see how delightful on the senses we young women are. My elderly gentleman will enjoy me. <laughs> A curious word, enjoy. Will I enjoy my gentleman, do you think? Will I enjoy being enjoyed by him? Meanwhile, my mother is my board. She courts the master assiduously on our behalf. She wants a sonata for her daughter before he is dismissed. What may a girl do to gain her own sonata? Mama thinks she may do much, almost anything, in fact. The outcome afterwards being already settled, what harm will a little love do in the meantime? But the sacrifice of my virtue will not be necessary. The sonata is mine for the asking, I believe. He will ask nothing in return, or if he asks and I say no, he will oblige me anyway. He has a savage honour. He is as odd in our society as if he had dropped here from the morning star. Do I love him? I should need to love myself a little first. And some days I am close to doing that. He holds up before me an idea of me which I had never seen until he came. Nobody else has that idea of me. There you are, he says. There you truly are. When I believe that, I will love him. And when I love him, what shall I do then? him improvise. I say, watch. Of course, one listens. A purist would close his eyes. But I love the spectacle, too. That pocked and bristly face, thrust forward chin, hair as black as a bat, the almost beastly hands. And out of that head, through those hands, into the keys and strings, the music comes endlessly invented and made real in our astonished ears. The music in his head, abstract as pure mathematics, made real through the medium of his ugly frame and a pompous contraption of wood and ivory and wire. So far his powers of improvisation have not been impaired by his affliction. He performs in the public view like a miracle worker. He has told me two things lately of great interest. First, that as a child, studying under the organist of the Minster Church in Bonn, he composed some pieces for the instrument which his own small hands were incapable of playing. In my long and unhappy meditation on how the good insights of the imagination may ever be put into practice on this earth, that little anecdote affected me almost... hopefully. You take my meaning. The idea is there. It is conceived. We are not yet grown into the means of its realization. Patience. Work in the meantime in faith and hope and love. And secondly, more striking still, he told me this, that he knows a work of his to be a good one if it shocks him as something unfamiliar when he sees it printed. 
He sits down in ugly scribbles the harmony he hears, the order he sees and sends the sheets away to be prepared in proper form. The work, on its return, shocks him. Him, its maker. Then he is delighted. He rejoices. I will hold him in my heart at that moment of his shock and joy. He will be my counterexample in our world of bloody realizations. We have surprised ourselves so often by the making real of our ideas, and not in joy and satisfaction, but in terror. Imagine a future when the world we make shocks us, its makers, by its beauty. I am free to leave. Our friend has given me his word, and I have given him mine. What word? The old word. Nothing new. Only the old word said and given again. The promise to live, and labor for the good we still remember and can still imagine. I leave at once. Juliet, the beloved, has warned me that I must. I see the beginnings of a lovely metamorphosis in her, and I should have liked to witness it a little further. Mm. with him and you against the people you despise, and among those people I must stay and live my life, for nobody will help me escape. Very soon now, Mama will marry me off. The law is on her side. The law is with the elderly bridegroom who will enjoy me. I will be their clown, their monster, the court fool. They will come to peer at me as they peer at the creatures in a filthy bedroom. I'll be a wife and mother like my mother is. I will daw the little. I will doodle. I will be left at liberty to ornament the house. But in its prison, my spirit will shrivel and grow bitter. I see it. I foresee it. What must be, shall be. Muss es sein. Es muss sein. I shall be inconsolable. But unlike him, I will not let affliction leech away the living life from me. I will take my fate by the throat. Mm -hmm. 
Seek my fate, the tree of life in the garden of the Hesperides. I will take hold of it. I will shake down from it the apples of immortality. I will never forget you. I will play this music. I am better now than I shall ever be again. When I play this music, I will recall the freedom of life I had with you. And when your affliction worsens, and in the world outside there is no longer any music you can hear, remember me. Remember me playing as I am.